Hello dear students, Assalamu alaikum. Today is our second week and we will begin our class today with, I guess you're hearing me better. So let me wait just for a second if anyone joins. Okay, people, let's begin our lecture because I hope that the uh, time of this lecture an hour before, okay, I posted on 2.30 on the WhatsApp group. So I'm not kind of um, wasting more time. So let's begin. Yesterday, in the last week, not yesterday, the last week we studied regarding the uh, cholinergic agonists and the muscarinic agonists okay so we studied this agonists okay and then we studied the indirect agonists okay and we studied the anticholinesterase poisoning also so we have uh, studied till this page of our first aid pharmacology section and today's lecture will be based on the muscarinic antagonists, okay? Also, I would uh, love to cover, uh, ask, okay, in the first state, they have not given about all of the muscarinic antagonists. So if uh, for the students who are preparing for uh, the examinations, which are uh, not PMDC related and they are preparing for PLAB or USMLE or other exams. So they need to stick to the first aid for pharmacology and they don't need to um, study the rest of the drugs that are not given in this because uh, this is the 2020 edition of first aid and it is the high yield one. Okay, but for those who are preparing for uh, the PMDC exam, they need to uh, go through the chart of the antagonist, of the cholinergic antagonist, considering both the muscarinic and the cholinergic. So before kind of beginning uh, this muscarinic antagonist, I, I just want to show you this uh, I just want to show you okay I guess if this is visible to you people okay this is I just made this a uh, classification for the, I just made this classification for the muscarinic and the cholinergic antagonist, okay? Just so that you may know which are the drugs that are involved in the um, opposite activity of agonist. And it is not given in your first aid that in that much detail. Uh, they've just uh, covered atropine in detail and they've just covered the side effect profile of these drugs. Uh, although that is important, but you need to know a bit more about them, okay? That in which category or in which class do they lie? Uh, in the license exams of other countries, this classification is not important. But for your NAB exam, they do ask questions which are very simple and easy. So you have to uh, cover and focus on the easier ones too, uh, apart from learning the complex, okay? So we have this, we have these two receptors. One of the receptor is 
the uh, muscarinic one, okay, and the other receptor which we studied is the uh, nicotinic receptor that is what we called uh, at present at the level of ganglion, okay, and, and the another nicotinic receptor is the one that is present on the neuromuscular junction. So we write the receptors uh, initials as M, N, 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 M. So you should know that this one is muscarinic, okay, this one is nicotinic present on the ganglion and this one is uh, the one which is present at the neuromuscular junction okay and you will find this receptor only in the skeletal muscles okay skeletal muscles and you will find the muscarinic receptors always at the uh, post synaptic end if if like i don't know there are some students who have entered who have not taken my uh, previous classes so for them i just want to tell you that we have this um, we have this neuron okay this is a presynaptic neuron and then it 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 makes a synapse okay this 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 thing is called a synapse okay when the one neuron end and the other neuron cell body united together okay and then this other postsynaptic neuron, okay, uh, just release the neurotransmitter at the level of effector organs, okay? So just for say example, this is an effector organ. For example, uh, your glands, for example, your smooth muscles, for example, your cardiac muscles, okay? So this, this is another, or for example, adrenal gland, okay? But this is just an example, but in case of adrenal, we will not be talking about acetylcholine, right? So at this particular level, uh, acetylcholine is released all the time. All the time acetylcholine is released. Either this is a sympathetic neuron or either this is a parasympathetic neuron, okay? But uh, when we talk about the parasympathetic neuron at the effector level, there is always acetylcholine. You will never see epinephrine or norepinephrine being released at this particular level. But if, just for say example, uh, this neuron is not parasympathetic and it is a sympathetic neuron, you will see acetylcholine be being released at this particular level in the sweat glands. So that was an exception uh, to, to make it more better. Let me take you to, wait a second. Let me take you back to the first page of the book where it was started. There is a very good diagram. Okay, I have taught this all uh, in my first lecture of pharmacology. So I told you to remember the sweat glands because this is the most favorite MCQ being asked. This, this whole section is sympathetic and we will never see acetylcholine being released on the effector side. Okay, except sweat glands. So, uh, at the level of effector organs, at the level of effector organs, the, the receptors which will receive acetylcholine will always be muscarinic, okay, will always be muscarinic. So you need to remember this, that at the effector organ level, the receptors are muscarinic in case of acetylcholine, because we are studying cholinergic right now, okay, not adrenergic. But at the synaptic end, okay, we will, uh, the, the receptors that will receive acetylcholine can be NN and they can be NM. They have not shown NM here. Yes, they have. Wait a second. Here it is. Okay, they have shown NM receptor here. This is the neuromuscular junction and this is the skeletal muscle, you will always see the NM receptor at the skeletal muscle level. Okay, and uh, this uh, type of um, nervous system is called somatic nervous system and it is not a part of autonomic so you should know this difference also that uh, the skeletal muscles are not a part of autonomic nervous system okay um is there any question you can ask the question in uh, the chat so that it may not cause distortion okay so um I think you should, you should be clear about this, okay? And you should know that all these NN receptors, either the neuron is parasympathetic or the neuron is sympathetic, 
the nicotinic ganglionic receptors will be present at this level of ganglionic chain okay this is autonomic ganglionic chain paravertebral uh, ganglion we call it okay also you see at the level of adrenal medulla we have this nn okay so at the level of synapse or ganglion you will always see nn receptors okay but at the level of um, effector organs that are that are having this acetylcholine you will see the muscarinic receptors okay and the neuromuscular junction obviously again acetylcholine so these concepts should be really clear uh, when you're studying pharmacology uh, because uh, if you'll know about the receptors and what um, neurotransmitter they are gaining um, it will be easy for you to deal with it further okay now i'll go back to this uh, classification before moving to the first aid book okay so you see now this these are the anti this is the anti they're they're working opposite to what acetylcholine functions so i've taught you the um, i've taught you the synthesis of acetylcholine and i've taught you the uh, how the all the agonist drugs work uh, on the receptors okay both a reverse both reversible and irreversible one a direct or indirect one okay so i have told you that thing now there is this uh, these all drugs that are that are this is for example your presynaptic neuron and this is for example your postsynaptic neuron okay and here at this level acetylcholine is released and it works on these receptors okay so this is kind of a direct agonist action and take this if, if this is not acetylcholine if this is some cholinergic agonist drug let's say for example this is carbacol or this is bitanicol or this is pilocarpine these all drugs are the cholinergic agonist right and they are direct ones so they directly act on the receptors but then but then we have some other drugs that do not act on this receptor and they allow acetylcholine to work on this receptor by holding an enzyme that we call acetylcholine esterase enzyme and this enzyme what does enzyme do this enzyme destroys this acetylcholine okay and it hydrolyzes this into two parts that is acetate and choline and the choline will go back up and it will enter the neuron for the synthesis of acetylcholine back again so this is a cycle okay so what the indirect drugs will do they will they will keep a hold on this this little body and they will say you you, you can't do your function until I'm, I'm here so what they will do they will keep a hold they they, they act like guards okay they act like guards and they keep a hold on this for example Uh, we have studied in previous classes the drug edrophonium okay we have studied uh, in the previous classes the drugs for uh, alzheimers and myasthenia gravis for example neostigmine physostigmine okay we have studied all these drugs so they were also the cholinergic agonist drugs but they were indirectly working they were working on this um, they were acting as a guard for this acetylcholine esterase enzyme and they were allowing acetylcholine to work more okay so now so that was the function of the agonist okay i'm just i'm just giving a review of previous lectures so that we may continue our today's lecture after this uh, two days um gap okay saturday and sunday gap so now our today's solely lecture is on antagonist thing so what this antagonist will do the name tells you that they do the opposite function okay what acetylcholine does or what acetylcholine uh, like drugs do they all will do an opposite function and first of all up till here you should be clear regarding the classification okay and then we will move to the mechanism of action so these are the drugs that will act on the m receptor okay they will act against this m receptor okay all of them atropine benzotropine cyclopentylate dorifenacin ipratropium tiotropium oxybutyrin scopolamine sulfonylacin and tropicamide now i'm telling you there are few drugs that that whose names are really important for your um examination point of view and you should remember their names 
for example atropine you should remember this atropine because it is an antidote to uh, the cholinergic agonist drugs as well okay then you have to remember benztropine because it can cross the blood brain barrier and it can show its side effects on the central nervous system okay similarly you should remember this uh, ipratropium and tiotropium because they uh, are anti asthmatics they can be used in asthma patients they can be used in cobd patients as well okay so uh, you know now i will i will go to the mechanism of action that how they are working on these organs but you need to remember some of the names um for the purpose of uh, you know systemic pharmacology also and and your exam also then you should know regarding the oxybutyrin okay oxybutyrin and solifenacin both of them act on the um on your urinary system okay on your bladder so so these are also important and then this is the most favorite mcq of pmdc what scopolamine does okay so you have to remember the mechanism of uh, the the, ther the therapeutic use of uh, scopolamine as uh, it is a drug for motion sickness okay it is a drug for motion sickness so we have we have two types of drugs students do confuse themselves in two drugs one is for motion sickness and one is for uh, altitude sickness okay one is for motion sickness is like you are sitting in a train or you are sitting in a bus you're just traveling okay and and you have this uh, because of because your body is in motion with respect to the environment you are traveling they they feel nausea and vomiting the patients feel nausea and vomiting so that is what we call motion sickness and for that there is a drug called scopolamine it comes in patches so it is intradermal okay but then we have another drug which is for heights okay we call it altitude altitude sickness so and that is acetazolamide so you should know that is not a drug of cholinergic or adrenergic effect that is a drug uh, which you will study in uh, uh, in renal pharmacology it is a carbonic anhyd anhydrase inhibitor cai okay so acetazolamide is is the altitude sickness drug and scopolamine is a motion sickness drug so this is this is these are the two things students confuse so that is why i am telling regarding this acetazolamide at this particular level i will not write the full name okay so 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 these are certain things which you should know uh, with for the purpose of your like examination because side effect profile is very important and also the mechanism of action then you have this ganglionic blockers now the ganglionic blockers means we are talking about the nn receptors okay the the nicotinic ones that are present at the level of synapse or ganglions okay so we have this nicotine in in your in your book if you'll go back to your textbook for example your um, calcium or your lipincott you will not find a lot about nicotine but these days as it's it's been used as a drug also and it's been uh, used for you know uh, abusive purposes also so so one should know about the dosage of nicotine uh, sometimes the mcqs come uh, way uh, out of the syllabus so so there have been a uh, few mcqs that have been uh, came in previous uh, years regarding nicotine so you should uh, be well aware of i will tell you and then these are hexamethonium and uh, mecamylamine okay so uh, i have written nicotine two times okay so these two drugs so the, the, they all they all of them are basically the blocking this nn receptors that are present at the level of this ganglionic chain you have not even reached the effector organ you you are just at the level of ganglions and you are blocking it so no effect over here okay and then nmj blocker so we are only talking about the somatic nervous system over here no autonomic nervous system so when in the somatic nervous system we do not have a pre and a post neuron we only have one neuron that directly goes to the skeletal muscle so so we are only talking about this 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 one particular neuron the somatic nervous system okay and these are the drugs among all of them the succinylcholine is the most important one okay so um i think the classification is pretty clear to you all so you should know regarding the how how we classify the uh, cholinergic antagonists okay now i'll move to the the book 
okay so this is but let's let's come back to the book if you have if you have your book you can open it on page number uh, page number 241 in the uh, 2019 book and i guess it all it is also page number 241 in your 2020 edition because i i, I am right now using 2020 edition it's page number 241 here also okay so so you can write it okay you can write what i'm telling you so now, now let's begin with uh, first of all now you see they have only uh, told you regarding on which organs they act and and what are their therapeutic implications so they have not told you about the uh, mechanism of action that that how these uh, drugs are basically working and 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 at what particular level they are they are doing their work so for the mechanism of action um, it is very simple as as we have studied in the uh, in the agonist thing so let me take you to this uh, picture this is the picture from your lipin card book and we have studied it uh, for the synthesis of this is acetylcholine no it is not acetylcholine wait a second this is acetylcholine okay so this is this is acetylcholine and we studied it from the lipin card book the synthesis of acetylcholine so i'll just i'll just tell you now what your antagonist drug will do okay so let's say for example this is atropine now this is not ac or 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 i may say this this is your atropine okay i just draw atropine over here this is acetylcholine okay and this is atropine now what this atropine will do this drug has another site on this there is always this one receptor okay but for for the drug site but uh, drug site or the or the uh, neurotransmitter site but the but the affinity of drugs it depends on the affinity of drugs that the power of their binding is how much stronger or weaker okay as in comparison to the neurotransmitter so the antagonist drugs have this high affinity as compared to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine so they don't let this um, acetylcholine get binds to this uh, receptor and they come and just bind to this receptor okay so so they are uh, doing their function really direct and what they'll do they will shut down this receptor because because they are the antagonist drugs and they will they will perform the opposite actions to what uh, to what this neurotransmitter acetylcholine do and i told you the the uh, the actions of acetylcholine were increase lacrimation more and more tear production okay more and more sweating more and more urination increase gi motility okay so the if in adverse phase if we talk about gi motility you the patient can have diarrhea okay uh, bronchoconstriction so you know decrease uh, respiratory rate so so these can be the uh, effects also and can be the side effects also of these okay bradycardia increase heart rate so this was all acetylcholine was doing because it's a parasympathetic hormone okay so it will it will perform all those functions that that are dominating when we are in a rest phase but when i'll talk about this antagonist all the functions will become opposite for example lack of tears okay dry eyes dry mouth no salivation uh no uh, not no urination but decrease urination okay decrease gi motility bronchodilation so that more and more air, uh, passage of air okay uh, so increase heart rate so all of these things will become opposite okay in acetylcholine you have seen meiosis okay but but here you will see midriasis so this is this is how uh, they 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 work like opposite so so it will not let acetylcholine function and it will come and bind to this receptor so uh, blocking its function so that's how it will cause all the opposite effects okay now you're getting my point this is how they work 
Now let me go back to the book. So it's uh, do we have any question? No. Okay, let's let's begin it. Now you see atropine. Atropine, a uh, homo, atropine, or amide. All of these drugs have their actions on the eye, okay? And what they'll do, they produce midriasis and cycloplagia, okay? Now, um, let me show you a picture. I, I, I used that picture when I was teaching you. Wait a second. When I was teaching you open ang open angle glaucoma. I I there was a very beautiful picture. This one. Okay. You see, now I will repeat for the students who are new here. Uh, I guess few of them are new. So most of you have taken my previous lecture. So you see now this is your ciliary muscle of the eye. Okay. And this is iris. This this thing, this pink thing is iris, okay? This thing is cornea, okay? This is this whole disc shaped thing which you're seeing is the trabecular meshwork from where your uh, aqueous humor drains out, okay? And this little circle which is left is for your uh, uh, for your light to come in and uh, strike on your lens and cause an image while going back to your optic nerve. So now you, uh, so this is this is your structure of your eye. Now what happens? Midriasis is the dilatation of pupil, okay, and meiosis is the uh, con contraction of pupil. So basically, it's not the pupil that's contracting or dilating. There are two set of muscles that are helping this pupil to contract and dilate. This mechanism is very important because uh, most of the examiners do not ask a direct question that you will see meiosis or you will see midriasis. They will use the word ciliary muscles, okay? Uh, and they will use the, mus the, the word radial muscles. So you will be hearing these two terminologies frequently in, um, in the MCQ, ciliary muscles and radial muscles. That shows you have a good concept of um, the midriasis or meiosis that how they occurs, okay? So uh, you see, now, when, uh, when your ciliary muscles, now, first of all, let me uh, tell you how this, this, this uh, pupil becomes smaller, how this pupil becomes smaller, okay, from this, this is the normal size, okay, this is the smaller size, and let's say, for example, this is dilatation, just for, just for example, okay, now, this is the normal one. And this is the meiosis and this is the midriasis, okay? So what happens when the pupil is undergoing meiosis thing is, now let me remove that dilatation and let me remove this normal also. These ciliary muscles contract. When they contract, this, this iris becomes more linear and longer because of the contraction of these muscles. Don't take it as they are contracting and pulling it backwards. No, it's not the phenomena. They are contracting and making this iris that is in this iris is in a relaxed posture. So when the ciliary back here, they are contracting, they are making it thinner and longer. Okay, so this is the mechanism of, of this contraction of ciliary muscles. So they are what they are doing is this iris will become elongated and thinner and it will it will constrict this 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 wider portion into this smaller space for the entrance of light so this is how we undergo meiosis okay also for example this is your lens okay and at the side of your lens there are some other muscles, which we call the radial muscles, okay? They are present in, in circular fashion. They're present in circular fashion. So when the ciliary muscles contract, these radial muscles relax. They will relax, okay? So like they, they both function in opposite fashion 
to to cause meiosis so this uh, this mechanism you should know for meiosis but when we go for uh, midriasis that is dilatation now now this is the normal okay and now i i am making it more space to dilate this pupil and for the accommodation of more and more light so what will happen now the ciliary muscles will relax okay they will they will relax a bit more and that will help this little body iris to to relax more so because of ciliary muscles this iris will relax more and 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 from this position it will come back to this position same goes here so that will make more space for the light to accommodate okay so this is how we will work in the case of midriasis now let me go back to um our book so now you see with atropine it will produce midriasis and cycloplegia if you remember the um there is a poisoning which we called op poisoning organophosphate poisoning which is because of the pesticides the farmers use for crops okay and the drug in that uh, in that spray that we use for crops to prevent it from insects uh, has ecothiophate okay in it or 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 um, there is another name written in your uh, textbook of uh, first aid parathion so you have parathion or ecothiophate in in this organophosphate as drugs okay and what they do they causes this midriasis which is a muscarinic effect oh sorry they causes meiosis which is a muscarinic effect okay and then when the patient has this op poisoning we give atropine to the patient to overcome his muscarinic side effects okay so meiosis is a uh, meiosis is a um, action is a action of cholinergic agonist but um when we give a drug dose higher than normal okay we misuse that drug those actions become side effects okay they will they will enhance more so so meiosis that was an action will become a side effect too in case of op poisoning and to overcome that we give it the patient the antidote which is atropine to overcome the muscarinic effects okay there is another antidote which i taught you in the previous lecture uh, was um, pralidoxine okay that will overcome the nicotinic effect so now at this particular level what atropine will do it will cause midriasis okay and also cycloplegia why cycloplegia because you know you see these radial muscles that are present surrounding this i this this lens okay they cause it it's paralysis so that the the normal function of our uh, the normal function that that counteract the the effect of drugs that are going inside our body will cause you know not cause the overcome or the recurrence of those uh, symptoms that we are trying to block okay so for a certain time period it is irreversible cycloplegia for a certain time period until the drug is doing its work these radial muscles will get paralyzed okay and the patient will not be able to move his eyeball either or there okay and you will see this midriasis the dilatation of pupil for more accommodation of light and also it will help in the flow of the aqueous humor from this from this trabecular meshwork the aqueous humor flow from this trabecular meshwork okay if i show you this this diagram of um, of this open versus closed angle glaucoma this is the trabecular meshwork okay it it is present all over here just as you you can see it this is all this all is a trabecular meshwork okay and there's a canal present at this region like at this this these corners which we call sclems canal okay so this is how these these thing this is a sclems canal okay this is how these things work so it will it will help in it will help in the flow of humor also 
So uh, these are the things you should you should need to remember regarding atropine. Now atropine, uh, if if you don't mind, I will I will leave these rest of the drugs and I want to cover this atropine from below. Okay, so that you may study the atropine is a very important drug. So you may study it all in detail and then we will come and quickly uh, cover this section. Okay. Uh, okay, for the students who are, who are listening me right now, uh, our recording, not our recording, our live lecture will end at uh, 6 minutes 40 seconds, okay, because there is a time limit on Zoom of 40 minutes uh, class or meeting, okay. So you have to join it again from the same link that is uh, given in your WhatsApp group. Okay, so just go back and tap on that link again and join the class because we will continue this. We will finish this muscarinic antagonist today. So let's 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 read atropine. So now atropine is a muscarinic antagonist. I've told you much enough about it. Used to treat bradycardia. So that means it is working on M2 receptors. Okay, uh, we have this M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5 receptors and. Uh, uh, the M2 receptors are responsible for the heart, okay? They are present on your SAAV node and also on your um, atria uh, myocardium, not on your ventricular myocardium. So you should know this. Muscarinic uh, M2 are present on your atria myocardium. Okay, let's say, for example, this is your heart. So um, the diagram is very bad. So this is your uh, atrium myocardium, and this is your SA node, and this is your AV node, okay? So at this particular level, your M2 receptors are present. And for ophthalmic applications, so I, I told you. Now you see it, it's working on the eye and it is causing mitriasis, that is pupil dilatation and cycloplagia, as you read above, okay? In the air wave, in the airway, you have the bronchioles have M3 receptors, okay? The bronchioles have M3 receptors, even the eye have M3 receptors. So you should know this. Eye, airway, stomach, gut, bladder. All of them have M3. M2 are present on the heart, okay? So you should know this. On the airway, what are they doing? What acetylcholine do? Let's say, for example, this is M3 receptor and these are bronchioles, okay? These are bronchioles. Acetylcholine will come and bind at this little receptor at your bronchioles and it will cause your, it will cause your, what I'm doing is, this is your trachea, okay? And this is these, these are your uh, principal bronchus. And then you have these lungs, okay? So now here you have this secondary bronchioles and then tertiary and then, you know, little ones, so bronchioles, okay? So at these levels, at these levels, okay? They, what, what, what acetylcholine do? Acetylcholine will cause them to narrow that we call bronchoconstriction so the diameter of this bronchioles will become narrow and the patient will unable to breathe properly okay that acetylcholine do but we are studying antagonist atropine what it will do atropine will make these bronchioles dilated so in a normal individual this will become more dilated but in an individual who already has this constricted bronchioles for example the patients with obstructive lung diseases uh, includes asthma and copd okay these bronchioles will become dilated and the patient will have a good airway for expiration and inspiration Okay, so atropine is used in um, patients with asthma, but because of its uh, mecha like mechanism of action, mode of action, time of uh, time the drug 
takes we don't use uh, it uh, frequently in asthmatic patients we use triotropium or ipratropium more and other beta blockers etc okay so you should um, but you should know it is causing bronchodilation and will also decrease the secretions so that uh, the the production of cough can also get reduced because secretions the mucus inside also thins the uh, bronchioles okay and then uh, you have this uh, stomach so atropine will decrease the acid secretion if you remember from our previous lecture uh, when i was teaching you when i was teaching you bithanicol if you remember here when i was teaching you this bithanicol i told you if we take it as three b's like one b for bethanicol one for bowel and one for bladder okay so that one for bowel what it was doing it was increasing the gi motility and it was increasing the gi motility by two functions one uh, the con it, it was increasing the contraction in the at the level of gut okay at the level of duodenum ileum and it was in the stomach it was increasing the acid production so that the food may digest really quick okay but here because we are studying the antagonists now what atropine is doing it will decrease this acid secretion and it will help the food not to dissolve quickly and the food will remain in your stomach for a longer period of time because hcl is the acid that is uh, released from your gastric parietal cells okay of your stomach and and this acid helps in the digestion of food okay uh, students we have less than 1 minute left and the record and this lecture will automatically stop so you have to tap on that link from whatsapp group and come back and join again and i will wait okay so in the stomach you will have this decrease acid secretion and in the gut okay the small intestine you will see decreased motility so the overall effect will be decreased digestion of food so this is the another action okay